Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the twelfth episode of the story in which Hiruzen takes charge and finds a way to fulfill Minato's dying wish. Much has changed in the Narutoverse since the clan heads and Danzo have joined forces to train Naruto. Naruto accepts his parents' and clan's final wish to bring peace to the elemental nations. Join our smarter and more OP blonde knucklehead on his unique path to peace. This story is from Bjdakuch. Please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Godame Hokage The Hokage Tower was abuzz in preparations for Naruto's ceremony. Tomorrow, Naruto would be named the Godame Hokage of Kanahagakure no Sato and Kanoha was preparing for a massive celebration. The reason for the rush was secretly that Minato and Kushina wanted to be the for their son's inauguration and swearing into the office. They only had three days left on their deal with the Shinigami and Naruto wanted to share the moment with them. Hiruzen had a fire in his eyes that screamed, I can see the end of the tunnel, as he directed people for his last official day as Hokage. Naruto walked into the council room to present himself to the Jonin Council and the Fire Daimyo. This was no more than a formality at this point, but it was still deemed necessary and Kenji, the fire daimyo, really wanted to be present. Kenji had tried throughout the years to curry favor with Naruto, even though it was normally the other way around. Kenji realized that Naruto was the centerpiece of fire country's success and that he would continue to be a key figure, hell his whole clan would be key. Thus, Kenji made the trip an extra effort to get a little bit of face time with the hero of the elemental nations. Kenji opened up the ceremonies. Ah, Naruto-kun, it is good to see you again, even if this is a bit ahead of schedule. Naruto bowed to show respect. Kenji Dano, it is likewise great to see you again. I am most grateful for all of the support that you have granted me throughout the years. Kenji waved his fan in front of him to cool himself down. Oh ho ho, you are too kind, young man. Now, you have been called before me and the Jonin Council to discuss your nomination as the Godame Hokage. Is it your wish to assume the mantle and faithfully serve Fire Country and Kanahagakor? Hi, Daimyo-sama. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikes, I accept your nomination and look forward to working with you. Once these formalities are concluded, we should sit for some lunch. It would be my pleasure to invite your beautiful wives as well. Naruto hesitated for a brief second before answering. I humbly accept, Daimyo-sama. Naruto created a clone and dispersed it to inform his clone at the Namikaze compound of the development. Very good, Naruto-kun. Now, the Jonin Council has some questions for you. Kenji concluded with a wave toward the council before placing his hands in his lap. Shikamaru Nara stood up to ask the first question. Naruto-san, every member of the Jonin Council agrees that you are a good nomination for the Hokage position. This issue boils down to a couple questions. First, do you believe you are ready to assume the mantle of Hokage? Naruto nodded. Yes, Shikaku-san. I am ready. May I assume that you are concerned about the number of duties I find myself carrying? Shikaku nodded and there were multiple nods on the council as well. Your concerns are valid. As with everything I am currently doing, I will not be doing this alone. Without Q. I wouldn't be able to keep up, however, with Q's help and a bit of meditation I can maintain the stress created by my clones. For the previous three years, I have had 200 clones training daily, I have sustained a blood clone or two for that duration, I have balanced seven wives and dealt with two heads of nation that also wish to be my brides and I have created and trained the allied forces from the ground up. Forgive me if I sound precocious, but the responsibilities of Hokage will not be a significant addition. Gunma stood up. Naruto-san, do not make light of the position. It is because you have all those prior obligations that we are wondering why you wish to do this now. Naruto did not show any sign of hesitation before he answered. We are coming to the conclusion of this war, but we have not gotten here without losses. Nearly 300 of our compatriots have died and more are recovering in the hospital. 
it will serve as a morale boost for the Allied forces for the final push into AIM. I have personal reasons as well that I cannot share with this council. Shikaku cocked an eyebrow at this. Naruto, we all have clearance here. Not from Shinigami-sama you don't, Naruto retorted sharply. Kenji leaned forward at this. So, it is true? You are the summoner of the Shinigami? No, Daimyo-sama. I have simply restored an ancient pact between my clan and the Shinigami. She calls me her champion in the mortal realm. She gave me firm instructions that I cannot disclose to this council. I assure you it does not adversely affect Kanoha or the allied forces. Her champion? Kenji asked with interest. Yes, Daimyo-sama. I am the champion of the Shinigami. I will tell you that I have killed three individuals on her behalf. Haydn, Kakuzu and Kabuto all used jutsu that broke the natural order of her realm. Her request to eliminate said individuals synced up very well with my mission. Most interesting, Naruto-kun. Most interesting indeed. Shikaku stood once more. During the war, will you continue to act as the Allied Forces Supreme Commander over your role as the Hokage? I do not believe the roles are mutually exclusive, Shikaku-san. When I am acting on the war front, Sandem-sama has already agreed to help with my duties alongside my blood clone. Furthermore, I will increase office personnel to handle the more mundane paperwork. All requests from the civilian council will be routed through their chosen representative. That representative will get a pay raise for their efforts, but they will be given certain authorities to fund civilian projects. The ninja council will retain direct access to me, however, all clan issues will go through the clan heads, who will also be given guidelines and certain liberties. I will retain the right to veto and I will handle all major issues personally, but the age of every single issue coming to the Hokage's desk will come to an end. Shikaku sighed. Troublesome. What inspired you to create these changes? Naruto laughed at this. I am the supreme commander of the Allied Forces. When running a military, the answer presents itself. Every ninja reports to his, her squad leader. Squad leaders filter this information and report to their platoon leaders. Platoon leaders go through their company commanders. So on and so forth. So, Shikaku, why would you not apply the same principles to governing the village? The whole Jonin council was gobsmacked. Jaws on the floor and Naruto got a priceless photo to add to his collection. Kenji actually chuckled loud enough for the whole council to hear. And you would still doubt this young man? If so, I challenge the rationality of this council. Kenji's tone was full of mirth as he mocked the Jonin council. Shikaku stood and looked like being the speaker of the Jonin council was seriously troublesome. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikes, the Jonin Council unanimously approves your nomination as the Godaim Hokage. I am grateful for your nomination, and I humbly accept. Daimyo-sama, I have made reservations at the VIP suite in Ichirakus for 4 p.m. I will bring my wives and look forward to the chance to dine with you. Naruto bowed and walked out of the council room. Naruto, his wives, Tsunade, Jiraiya, Sarutobi, Minato, and Kushina joined the fire daimyo and Madame Shirjimi for dinner at Ichiraku's. Minato and Kushina wore henges until they confirmed the that they were alone before Minato reunited with Kenji. Kenji was overjoyed to see his old friend and subsequently saddened to know that he would only be there for another couple days. It was a great night and set the stage in a positive manner for Naruto's nomination. Naruto got a good night's sleep and rose in bed with all his girls. Kushina had cooked him a hearty breakfast and the girls led him out the front door for his big day. Naruto took the time to walk to the Hokage Tower and he was swarmed by ninjas and civilians alike. All wished him good luck and congratulations as he walked by. His foreman detail took the roofs overhead and maintained awareness as their leader made his journey. 
Naruto appreciated all the decorations that were set up and was pleased to see that allied banners and banner of all nations were hung throughout the streets. A normally 15-minute trip took Naruto half an hour due to the extra attention. Hiruzen welcomed him into the tower and sat him down in his office to give him his final speech. Naruto-kun, it brings me great joy to finally reach this day with you. I wish to give you a similar speech that my predecessor gave me, and I gave to your father. Naruto simply nodded so Hiruzen continued. Konoha is the great tree that shelters and protects us. It is for this tree that we send shinobi to fight, and it is for the glory of this great tree that the fire shadow acts. The fire shadow dances between the light of the sun and the shade of the leaves. It is the duty of the Kage to guide his people through the darkness of night to meet each day. The fire shadow must be able to sacrifice not only his own life, but the lives of his shinobi in order to protect the great tree. With each leaf that falls, the will of fire ignites and passes the will on to the budding leaves. As old leaves wither, new leaves take their place and carry on the will of fire. Hiruzen stopped here and took a long drag on his pipe. Naruto-kun, I have watched you since the day you were born, and I could not be prouder of the man you have become. I have never seen anyone that carries the will of fire the way you do. It is this old man's sincerest wish that you never let that fire die, my boy. Naruto had tears brimming at the rim of his eyes. Sure thing, Gigi. I have had sixteen years to follow your example. Thank you for all you have done for me. I promise to do everything in my power to make sure the will of fire is passed on to future generations of Kanoha and hopefully every country in the elemental nations. I love you, Gigi, and I am so happy you lived long enough to share this day with me. Cheeky brat. Hiruzen chuckled at Naruto's snark. Your fitted robes are on the wall over there and your Hayori is there as well. Please try them on and let me know if we need to make any last-minute adjustments. Naruto tried on his new robes before donning the low-necked, sleeveless Hayori that went down to the back of his knees. On the back of the white Hayori, his joint family crest rested right in the center of his back. Around the family crest were the symbols of the elemental nations, denoting that Naruto wished to serve all people of the elemental nations. The bottom of the Hayori was bordered in red flames in tribute to his father. The allied crest resided on Naruto's right collar while the Kanoha symbol rested on the left side of the collar. Overall, Naruto's Hayori was a sharp-looking symbol of Naruto's strength, resolve and bonds. The morning passed without incident in a hectic pace. Naruto's family joined him in the Hokage's office thirty minutes before the ceremony began and he gained confidence in their presence. Minato and Kushina watched through their ANBU masks as Naruto prepared to take leadership of the village that they gave their lives to protect. As the time came, the family made their way to the roof of the Hokage mansion. In tribute to Naruto, Kyumo, Kiri, Iwa and Suna all had their kage and details present. As Naruto walked onto the roof alongside Sarutobi they held their banners high and proud next to the Kanoha banner. Sarutobi walked forward to address the assembled masses and used a voice enhancement jutsu to project his voice. The camera crew worked to get good angles and capture Sarutobi's address. My dear people of Kanoha, Fire Country, and the Elemental Nations, it brings me great joy that I got to live to see this day. I have served Kanoha faithfully for the past fifty-eight years, Kami I am old. Hiruzen paused here as the audience laughed. I have done the best I could over my time in office. To protect the great tree and promote the will of fire. I have not been perfect, and I have made plenty of mistakes. It is with joy that I got to end on a positive note thanks to my successor. For the last three years, the elemental nations have experienced a taste of peace and prosperity that my successor has played a key part in, and I get to take all the credit. He paused here for another round of laughter and the camera caught his cheeky grin. In all seriousness, this old man couldn't be prouder to introduce to you Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Godame Hokage of Kanoha. An uproar of applause, shouts, 
cheers and a couple fog horns ripped through the air around Kanoha. Before Naruto walked to address the people, the flags of Kiri, Kyumo, IWA and Suna dipped slightly in a show of respect for Naruto. As Naruto walked to the edge of the railing he gestured with his hands and his wives stepped up to stand by his side. The camera panned across the beautiful visages of his wives to come arrest on Naruto's face. People of Kanoha, Fire Country, and the Elemental Nations, thank you for honoring me with this opportunity to serve you. I am proud and humbled to be named the Godaim Hokage. To the people of Kanoha, I ask for you continued assistance on this path to peace that we are walking. I am most grateful for everything you have done for me. I promise to do everything I can to serve you and lead us into greater prosperity. To the people of the Elemental Nations, the office of Hokage will not distract me from my goal. I care for each person in these nations, and I will continue to do everything I can to deserve the role of Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces. I give this vow to you. I will work to achieve peace, not under the rule of Kanoha's banner, but as a partner to your nations. I will bring as much happiness and prosperity as I can to as many people as I can. Naruto paused here and took a deep breath before a deadly serious look adorned his face. His eyes flashed with power and resolve through the camera lens. To my enemies and those that would seek to destroy this peace we are fighting for I say this. Be warned, if you stand in my way, you will feel my wrath. If you harm the weak, exploit those in need, take advantage of our kindness or seek destruction then I or those I trust will end you. Naruto flashed into his golden cloak after he made this statement. Thunderous applause and battle cries rang out across Kanoha. Every ninja stiffened their posture and their chests swelled with pride. Finally, I say this. To those watching in the occupied nations of Hoshi, Kusa, Kawa and Ishii I offer you a part of this peace and prosperity we are working toward. My shinobi have been instructed to treat you with respect, the daimyos have granted food and funds toward helping you rebuild, and our trade partners are reaching out to your villages. We do not seek to dominate you but do not mistake our kindness for weakness. Join us in this new age of prosperity and you have my word that your quality of life will increase. I will finish my address with this. I am proud to be named the Godame Hokage and I love the people of the Elemental Nations. Thank you for your time and continued support. In every major city around the Elemental Nations, celebrations were held in honor of the man that brought peace and prosperity, however, nobody celebrated harder than Kanoha. Although many shinobi remained on high alert, the party raged through Kanoha through the whole night. Naruto made the necessary public appearances with his wives and children before retiring to his compound a little after midnight. The girls laid the kids down in a nursery of sorts. The kids lay in five cribs, all in the same room. Minato and Kushina offered to watch the kids for the night so that the girls could give Naruto his surprise. Fortunately, and unfortunately for Naruto, that surprise did not include any rest for our intrepid hero. Naruto was walked into his bedroom by Koyuki after he bid goodnight to Shion. Shion wasn't ready for what was to come. Naruto walked through the door to see each of his wives laid out in seductive poses while wearing lingerie. Each girl had their set colors that they preferred, and their lacy bras and panties reflected their preferences. Ice blue for Samui and Haku, lavender for Hinata, regal purple for Ino, dark red for Kuratsuchi, Light purple for Anko, emerald green for Tamari and Koyuki exposed a black bra and thong when she dropped her kimono. Naruto laid on the bed and received a full-body massage from his girls. He was grateful that he taught them the trick to his chakra stimulation as multiple sets of tender hands removed all the tension that had built up throughout the stressful day. What followed the massage would make Eros, the Greek god of lust, blush. Eight beautiful women, numerous Naruto clones, moans, screams of ecstasy, fluids everywhere and smiles on comatose faces were a truly beautiful sight. It was nourishment for Naruto's soul. Naruto's first day as the Godaim Hokage was hectic. He had his introductory meeting with the council where he put forward his initial reforms. 
The council was keenly interested in gaining more autonomy and authority, but they were apprehensive about how these reforms would affect the power balance. The new scheme did allow for more authority, but Naruto would still have absolute authority over it all. If he detected anyone abusing their power, then he would make an example of them. He knew it would happen sooner or later, but he also knew that it wouldn't happen again after the first time. His first day in office marked the return of one of the key missions that he had dispatched his international team on months ago. A disheveled Karen, Tenzo and the rest of their team made their way into the office. Karen was clearly startled when she saw Naruto sitting at the Hokage's desk and Tenzo cocked an eyebrow. Ah, yes, you guys missed all of the fun yesterday. I was sworn into office and today is my first day as the Godame Hokage. Please provide me with a verbal mission report and then go take the week off. Naruto broke through Karen's confusion and the whole squad stiffened to attention. Tenzo stepped forward. We worked with international forces and shinobi from the Hidden Mist to find the three-tailed Jinchuriki. During the mission, we ran into two other parties that were interested in capturing the Biju. The first was a crystal user and her squad that were remnants of Orochimaru's faction and we found out they were working for Kabuto. The second was a plant-like creature that was half black and half white. This creature was working with the man in the orange mask. Naruto made a hand signal and Dragon descended from his place in the ceiling. Dragon, please go retrieve Hawk, Sasuke and Mikoto. I want them here for the rest of this report. Dragon disappeared to go and complete his task. Okay, so why don't you tell me about this group from Kabuto? I will let you know now that I killed Kabuto two months ago, so they were probably working on outdated orders. Tenzo bowed and differed to Karen. Naruto. I mean Hokage-sama, we rendezvoused with Shinobi from Kiri about three weeks after we left. We were patrolling the seas around Mizu no Kuni for a couple weeks when I finally detected the Sanbai's chakra signature. The Biju was submerged nearly 100 meters in a deep lake to the southwest of Kirigakor. During initial exploration, we were unable to contact the Biju. We various methods to bring it to the surface for a conversation without success. Then this squad from Kabuto showed up led by Gurin, a crystal release user. She decimated our forces and caused us to take severe casualties. We lost one member from our squad, Misamoto, and the Kiri attachment lost 70% of their members. Naruto cut in here and he was not pleased. Why did you not use the Hiratian Kunai I gave you to summon me? Tenzo answered. The Hiratian Kunai was in my backpack that was stolen during our journey to Mizu no Kuni, Hokage-sama. Naruto sighed and made a motion with his hand to continue the story. We were able to fight off the team from Kabuto after they fought the Sanbai. They had a young man with them that had some sort of auditory jutsu that really pissed the biju off. We were weakened after defeating the crystal user and that is when the man in the orange mask showed up with the plant creature. Naruto paused the story and waited for the requested parties to show up. Five minutes later they all entered the office. I have called you here because Tenzo and his squad had a run-in with the man in the orange mask. Sasuke ran over to Karen and gave her a big hug. He looked her over to make sure she was okay, and she reassured him that she was fine. Apologies, Hokage-sama. Sasuke smirked when he called Naruto by his title. Naruto waved him off with a dismissive hand and looked toward Tenzo to continue. The story. Tenzo restarted the tale. After we dealt with Kabuto's squad, we were set upon by Madara, the plant creature and multiple clones of the plant creature. At that point, I ordered a retreat because Madara was clearly above our level. Hawk stepped forward. Why didn't you use the Hiratian Kunai Hokage-sama gave you? His tone was irritated, and frustration leaked off of him in waves. Stand down, Hawk. They already explained that to me. They made a severe error previously in the mission. An error that I am presuming cost us the Sanbai? Karen answered. Yes, Hokage-sama. 
I remained in detection range once we retreated to the patrol ship. We were harassed and attacked by the white creature the whole time, but I felt the Sanbai's chakra disappear. Naruto slammed a fist on his desk in frustration. Damn it. That is a setback. While you were out, we have occupied all minor nations except Ishii and AIM. We are to begin our attack on AIM from all sides soon. The Sanbai may set those plans back a bit. Naruto lost himself in his musings as Tenzo explained what happened for the rest of the mission. Once their report was complete Naruto dismissed them and the Uchihas remained in the room. Naruto had the other ANBU leave the room so he could have the privacy this conversation required. Alright guys, I am sorry there didn't have more than that. This was our first sighting of him in ages, so I wanted you here to share it. No worries, Naruto-kun. We will get him. The preparations for the wide-scale barrier are nearly complete. It should be ready in a month or so. Mikoto's soothing motherly voice relieved Naruto of some of his worries. What barrier, Kachan? Asked Sasuke. Well, you know the seals that I use to protect Konoha to prevent use of space-time jutsu? Well, I have been working with the best in R&D to develop a barrier big enough to surround AIM. I know we will be able to corner Pain and Madara and there is no way in hell I will let them get away. From their report, we know that the white and black plant creature is the original white Zetsu and it is fused with what Kabuto referred to as black Zetsu. Those three need to be dealt with before the world can find peace. Dragon spoke up. Naruto, how are you going to power the barrier? Naruto smirked. Itachi and Shursue you can take off your masks when it's just us. I have stored several blood clones that are infused with Karama's chakra. They will be stationed at the eight cardinal directions around AIM along with the barrier devices. This barrier will form a giant sphere that isolates the whole area in its own space-time bubble. Nobody will be able to get away once it is powered until I release it. Shursue asked the next question. Are you sure that they can't power through it? Naruto shrugged. Duh no. Most likely not. We don't have enough time to test it completely, but I plan on using it for the element of surprise and hitting them hard. We cannot let them focus on breaking the barrier. The key component is you guys killing this Madara before he realizes that he is trapped. Think you can do it? Itachi, Shursue, and Sasuke smirked confidently at that. Mikoto just wore a worried look since she would not be partaking in the attack. She was on the village reserve force that would be responsible for defending Konoha in the event of a surprise attack. Naruto dropped out of business mode and a playful smile flitted upon his face. So, Itachi, I heard that you played hero for our visitor from Nadashiko during the last mission and she has done a 180? Mikoto scowled a little bit before her face softened. I swear, Naruto-kun. It was a 180. At first, all she did was ask about you and how we knew you. She didn't care for my Itachi-kun at all. Itachi put a hand on his mother's shoulder and his face remained as stoic as ever. It's alright, mother. I didn't have high expectations to begin with. The smallest of smiles flittered across Itachi's face. However, it has been pleasant. Since the battle for Hoshi. She is a good woman. It is not her fault that her imbecilic village elders told her to seduce Naruto-kun. Sasuke scoffed at that. Mission impossible, that one. Shursue laughed. Ha ha ha, yeah. Imagine being like, hey you're betrothed to the guy's blood brother, so just go and seduce the most sought after man in the world and thinking that there was any chance of success. Naruto sighed and held his hands up. I am innocent on this one. Anyway, Shursue, how is Shizen doing? My sources tell me that you two have gotten mighty cozy and I may or may not have sensed an additional chakra signature. Naruto ended in a brotherly taunt, however, he wasn't ready for Mikoto's explosion. Shursue Uchiha. You better have a very good explanation for this. 
Mikoto cracked her knuckles in a very cushion-like way. Shursue shot a look of betrayal at Naruto before dodging a punch from Mikoto. Relax, Mikoto-sama. It is very new news. We were going to tell you, but Shizun doesn't want to be pulled from the front lines. Naruto laughed at the whole situation. Kami, I need to catch up with you lot more often. Sasuke, I am sorry that Karen's mission took you away from her for so long. After morning training, you can have the rest of the next three days off. Thanks, Ruto. I appreciate that. Naruto waved them out of his office and invited them over for the family dinner tonight. It was time for Naruto to say goodbye to his parents and he wanted Mikoto to have the chance to say goodbye to Kushina. Later that night in the Namikaze compound, everyone who was there for the original summoning of Minato and Kushina was present, plus a few more. Naruto catered in Ichiraku's and laid out a proper feast for his guests and departing parents. Naruto summoned Shin to let her be a part of the dinner. Before dinner began, Shin pulled Naruto aside and made him an offer of exchange. Naruto gave a fleeting look toward the Uchiha family and nodded his head. Naruto and Shin disappeared into his room for twenty minutes and left his guests waiting. Naruto was sworn to secrecy about what happened during those twenty minutes but it appeared the beautiful and ethereal death goddess was positively glowing when they returned to the dining room. Behind them walked a man nobody had seen in six years and Mikoto fell to her knees when she saw him. The man walked over to the downed woman and helped her to her feet before embracing her in a deep hug. Itachi, Shursue and Sasuke were frozen when they saw the man and they remained completely out of it until the man walked over to them and gave them hugs. Tears flowed freely from all the women watching the touching reunion while Sasuke was bawling into his deceased father's chest. Fugaku stood in front of everyone in attendance looking slightly confused be happy to be there. He was given a place at the table next to his wife and sons and conversation resumed like his presence was the most natural thing in the world. The Uchihas were in their own little worlds while they were catching up with their fallen patriarch. Fugaku was swollen with pride at the men his boys had become, and he even acknowledged Shursue. Once everyone was present, Naruto offered a prayer to Kami and thanked her for the gift of family. He then opened the food up for consumption and everybody began to dig in. Strangely, Shin tried to sit on Naruto's lap for her place at the table until Naruto insisted that she could sit next to him. His wives cocked an eyebrow at Naruto, but none of them were stupid enough to say something to the death goddess. That didn't stop Kushina from glaring at Shin and giving the death goddess challenging looks. Minato just plastered his silly smile on his face and nodded his head to his son. The dinner was a great send-off for Naruto's parents and every single person in attendance felt happiness and contentedness fill their hearts. Sadly, a deal with the goddess of death is still a deal with the goddess of death. It took nearly an hour for people to say their goodbyes. Tears flowed freely as departing words were swapped between friends and family members alike. Kushina must have given the children five kisses apiece as she darted between them and tried to get one final memory out of her grandchildren. Naruto watched peacefully from the edge of the chaos while giving Shin a one-armed hug. He was ever grateful for Shin's gift to him and only hoped that twenty minutes was enough. He didn't know how his wives would react if they knew exactly what the death goddess wanted from him. Eventually, Fugaku, Minato and Kushina were standing at the front of the group next to Shin. She opened a portal back to the pure world and the three souls walked through it hand in hand. Shin sped over to Naruto and placed another chilling kiss upon his lips before she departed the living plane of existence. The group stood in a stunned silence before Sasuke ran over to Naruto and tackled him in a brotherly hug. Sasuke's cheeks were still stained with tears as Naruto patted him on the back. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It was nothing, brother. I just called in a favor. I thought it would only be fair since I got to see my parents again. Naruto said in a soft tone as he continued to rub Sasuke's back. In an extremely manly way, of course. 
Itachi and Shursue decided to join the insanely manly hug and they were most definitely not crying. Okay they were crying, and the hug was decidedly not manly. That didn't stop all the women in attendance from cooing at the cuteness of it all. Nor did it stop Eno from snapping a couple pictures for the photo album. The girls played keep away with the photo until the boys promised they wouldn't destroy the picture. Jiraiya was guffawing so hard that he nearly dropped baby Nawaki. Tsunade snatched Nawaki away from him before smacking him upside the head. The whole event was decidedly sad, but everyone left that night with their hearts just a little fuller and their resolve hardened just a bit more. Attack on a May month had passed since Naruto said goodbye to his parents and it had been a very hectic month. The Allied Forces R&D Department completed the barrier stabilization devices last week and Naruto was flashing them to the Allied Forces on various fronts. All nations began collapsing our aim and it took a whole month to push the coalition forces back into a megacore. Naruto was on the land of fire side of the massive lake that surrounded a megacore. There were eight allied encampments that were set up around the massive lake and the barrier devices were deployed in each of those encampments. The stage was set for the final attack on a megacore. Naruto sensed roughly 5,000 chakra signatures in the city of a megacore and he felt a massive collection of the presence he has become very familiar with below the city. Naruto was meeting with the strategic division and allied commanders to review the final assault. Naruto stands at the head of the massive tent to address the men and women he had come to rely on. He smiled as he looked at the determined visages of his allies and partners in his effort to spread peace. He thought about all the losses and sacrifices his people had made and the heartbreak associated with each and every loss. It saddened him but he couldn't afford to let it distract him. Okay everyone, I have compiled the Citrep, and we will review that now. The assault of AIM has lasted 27 days and the results are as follows. 7,000 confirmed enemy dead, 5,500 of those were Zetsu. From IWA, they report forces at 85% combat readiness. The last battle hit them very hard, and they have lost 480 shinobi with another 1200 wounded. They are holding down the northwest edge of the lake and Han is with their main encampment and Rashi is with their northern encampment. Any updates from IWA that need to be addressed now? Naruto looked at Kitsuchi and his advisors and got no. Response. Moving on, Kyumo is holding the northeast and eastern edges of the lake. The report 150 dead with 450 wounded. Their fight was pretty light compared to IWA, I think that is due to Ishii providing reinforcements. Killer B is holding down the front lines and Yujito is in their secondary camp. Kiri is holding the eastern to the southern edge of the lake and their forces are invaluable around this much water. They are operating at 90% combat readiness and denied needing any reinforcements. Yukata is stationed to help their encampments. Suna and Kanoha and holding the southern edge of the lake to the western edge. This is the southern encampment that I am holding down, and I have Gara responsible for Suna's main encampment. Suna is at 95% readiness while Kanoha is at 87%. They were late to call me into the fight against the Sanbai and the Three Tails inflicted heavy casualties on that front. Unfortunately, the Sanbai was unsummoned when I showed up and was able to escape before I could subjugate it. I will open the floor for any other updates before I continue. Kitsuchi stood up. It is as you said, Naruto Dano. Standing order for everyone in this tent, if you call me Naruto Dano or Naruto Sama, I am going to smack you a good one. We are all in this together, so just Naruto, please. Kitsuchi chuckled before resuming. Very well, Naruto, Ishii has been subjugated effectively, and my scouts show they have gone quiet. It is likely we dealt with most of their forces in that last battle, thanks for your reinforcements there. Naruto nodded his head and let him continue. Our forces have isolated the area around our lake with the massive mud barrier as planned. There have been probing attacks from the Zetsu creatures and they are frustrated they cannot tunnel outside of the barrier. Last night, 
a coordinated assault was made on our barrier device that we were able to repel. The extra local barrier you added is effective. Han and Rashi say that maintaining the barrier takes 10 to 15 percent of their chakra. No other reports at this time. Anyone else have an attack on the barrier devices? Gara stood up. No, we had five white Zetsu impersonate a squad last night, but the updates to the ID cards seem to be working. It is a lengthy and inefficient process, but it will work to screen and trance into a fortified position. AI chimed in here. Yeah, those white Zetsu creatures are sneaky bastards. Shur and my sensor ninjas are not able to identify them once they change their chakra signatures. The seals on the ID cards are holding up for my encampments as well. Very good, May, how are things with you guys? Era, Era, thanks for your consideration, Naruto-kun. May's seductive tone stopped after the intro and she went into serious mode. My forces are ready. They are still very upset about the Sanbai being used against them again, bad memories from the previous Mizukage and all that. Naruto nodded and then laid out the plan of attack that would take place tomorrow afternoon. Okay everyone, before we go into the planned attack, I wanted to inform you of my role first thing tomorrow morning. I will be sending in a string of clones to talk to Pain. After all this war, I want to give them a chance to prevent more bloodshed. I can sense somewhere around 5,000 Chunin level chakra signatures or above. Furthermore, I cannot tell how many but there is a massive number of white Zetsu underground and in the lake. Our barrier is containing the enemy, but we cannot give them enough time to figure it out. Anoki stood up here. Naruto-kun, what do you hope to accomplish by talking to Pain? It is pretty obvious at this point that he will fight us to the end. Throughout the month he has popped up and been forced to retreat when you were called to the battlefield. Not to mention this guy calling himself Madara has been pretty pesky too. Naruto took time to look at each member assembled for the meeting before responding. Everyone, this war has claimed enough life already. I am going to give them a chance to evacuate the civilians and allow any shinobi to surrender. After suffering repeated losses, I believe that their moral will be low. I want to capitalize on that by preventing as much loss of life as possible and show a bit of mercy before we end this war. It is unlikely that Madara will attack while I am doing this because I have disabled his spacetime technique and he is probably trying to figure that out, but I will have clones at each camp just in case. Shikaku Nara, lead strategist, stood up. This could give the enemy extra time to plot and exploit weakness, Naruto. I am aware of that, Shikaku, but you forget that every camp is within my sensory range. I will be able to know if they make a move before they can do anything. I need to talk to Pain and figure a way out of this before I order the murder of 75,000 civilians. They are hiding behind the civilian population at this point so I need to do what I can to spare the innocent. Nobody here wants that much blood on our hands. Shikaku sighed and muttered. Troublesome blonde commanders. All right everyone, return to your encampments and everyone is to remain on high alert until we see this through. We are at the finish line. Everyone stood and saluted Naruto and gave shouts of approval. Naruto answered their salute and remained in the command tent. He sat at his desk and closed his eyes to enter his mindscape. He walked across the verdant field of grass to go chat with his partner. Heya, Karama. Thanks for joining me for this one. The massive Kitsune opened one eye and looked at his partner. He was so proud of the man he had become. The kid never shied away from responsibility, never bitched or moaned and he always rose to the challenge. Sure thing, Kit. You know, when you promised me you would seek to attain world peace, I didn't think you meant in a couple years. I thought you would at least be old and grey before you. Accomplished that dream. Naruto adopted his signature pose and chuckled. Q could see the weariness in the normal resilient azure blue eyes. What's eating at you, Kit? Naruto sighed despondently. Q, 
Up to this point we have been able to limit most of the fighting and we have gone to extra lengths to limit collateral damage. Now, our greatest threat is hiding behind 75,000 people. If they don't accept my offer tomorrow. Don't stress about that, Kit. All you can do is make the offer. Damn it Q. We are talking about 75,000 people. Men, women, children, old farts and young babies. I don't. I don't know if. If I could give that order. Kurama transformed into his Q form and raised Naruto's chin to look him in the eye. The blood-red irises and black slits bore into the hesitant blue eyes with little resistance. Q didn't say anything, he just looked into his partner's soul and in turn Naruto got to see Kurama's soul. They remained looking at each other for a couple minutes before the trance broke. Q brought Naruto into a fatherly hug. Look, Kit, no matter what happens tomorrow, I am proud of you. I know you will do what you can but there is still only so much you can do. Show mercy when it is the time for mercy, forgive when repentance is given but do not waver in your resolve, Kit. You have done more to bring humanity together than any before you. Even the sage didn't bring so many people of different nations together. Naruto leaned his head into Kurama's chest and appreciated the hug. When Kurama's nine tails wrapped around Naruto's back and pulled him in, he felt the weight of the world temporarily lifted and was able to think clearly. He thought about what he would have to do, and he closed his eyes and prayed to Kami that what he was doing was right. Naruto didn't sleep that night. He stayed in the mindscape with Kurama and left periodically to deal with his duties. The tension of the whole war was coming to a head, and it was palpable to Naruto and every other shinobi. The massive blue-black barrier over the whole area made it feel like there was no escape from the coming dawn. Naruto walked out of the command tent at the crack of dawn and summoned fifty clone captains to go and complete their part of the mission. A Naruto clone began the long trek into AIM. He waterwalked for a mile and a half before he took the three-pronged kunai in his hand. The clone could see the massive wall surrounding the industrialized city, but Naruto knew he would be able to clear it. The clone leaned back and then went through a full throwing motion like a professional pitcher. The kunai sailed into the air at nearly supersonic speed, and it impaled itself on the tallest tower in a megacore nearly halfway up the tower. A long series of yellow flashes originated at the kunai's position and the chaos in aim began in earnest. Naruto clone captains flashed to the kunai and then created twenty light clones apiece. These clones were used for short missions where endurance or sustainability were not important. Nearly 1,000 blonde knuckleheads ran through a megacore no sato shouting at the top of their lungs. The clones were using chakra to project their voices in order to provide evacuation instructions. Many clones were popped during their efforts, but the message was starting to get out. The people of AIM swarmed into the streets with confused looks on their faces, but some of them heard what the clones were saying. I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, I am offering you a chance to avoid this fight. Any and all that wish to surrender or evacuate, make your way to the ports in an orderly fashion. AIM will fall today. We do not wish to involve innocent people, but your leader is hiding behind you. Get some things and go to the ports if you wish to evacuate. You have until 2 p.m. to evacuate. Clones ran around shouting while coalition forces did their best to quickly catch and destroy the troublesome blondes. Little did they know that this was just the first wave. Meanwhile, a Naruto clone captain made its way into the tower on a completely separate mission. This clone was tasked with talking to Pain. The clone was given a traveler's cloak with the stealth seal on it. This made it nearly undetectable as it made its way through the dark and eerie tower. The lower floors were being used as a command center, but after halfway up there was just emptiness. Empty, black and shadowy rooms occupied the floors of the upper tower. The Naruto clone made its way to the top floor and saw that this floor was different. There were signs of life on this floor. Weapons were laid out along with scrolls in a big library-like chamber. 
Naruto saw that there was a door leading to what he presumed to be Pain's chamber. Naruto being Naruto disabled the stealth cloak and knocked on the door. A raspy voice answered the knock and the door seemed to open on its own. As the clone entered, it saw a pale, red-haired man sitting on what looked to be a throne. The shaggy red hair creeped down over the right side of the figure's face and the rest of his body was hidden beneath the Akatsuki cloak. The Naruto clone showed itself with its hands raised and Pain instantly leveled his arm at the clone. Whoa, wait a minute. I don't have any weapons on me, I am just here to talk. Tell me. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you here and now. You have thwarted my plans at every turn. You have killed my men and brought war to this nation. Pain's raspy voice was filled with anger and frustration. The Naruto clone smirked at Pain. Well, for starters, I am just a clone. The boss wanted to talk with you and if you kill me, he will just send ten more. For your last claim, I didn't start this war, Pain. I brought together historical enemies in an effort for peace. I united the Great Five and instead of letting me spread that peace throughout the nations, you united them under the banner of hatred and hysteria. Enough. You know nothing of pain. It is only through pain that the world can find peace. It is only through pain that the people of this world will halt their endless slaughter. Only once I have the biju will this world know peace. The Naruto clone couldn't hold it in anymore it opened up with full-on laughter. Oh yeah? Tell me, Mr. Wise Guy, what will you do with the biju to achieve this peace? Do not mock me, mortal. I am a god in this world. Pain rose from his throne and looked ready to throttle the Naruto clone. Naruto's laughter increased at that. You? You? You believe you are a god? Oh, Kami, that's funny. The clone raised its right hand to show Nagato the seal on his hand. Do you know what this is, Pain? Pain looked wearily at the seal on the Naruto clone's hand. He didn't respond he just looked at the seal through his Rinnegan eyes. Let me tell you then. I am not allowed to since I am just a clone, but this is the seal of the Shinigami. The Shinigami is a real goddess. You are a man in possession of powerful eyes. Tell me, Pain, can you even disable those Rinnegan eyes of yours? Pain balked a little at Naruto's challenging tone, especially at the last question. What does that matter? These are the eyes of a god. The last person that had these eyes was the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto just sat there shaking his head until he cried out in frustration. Oh, for the love of Kami. If you can't deactivate your dejitsu it means that it doesn't belong to you. They were a transplant. From what I am sensing I can pretty much confirm that. A simple DNA test would be more than enough to prove that. Oh well, that's besides the point. Your body continually degenerates because those eyes don't belong to you, and they continually pull power and life force from you. The point of me telling you this is that you are an idiot. Pain scoffed. Don't pretend like you know me, boy. I have seen pain, I have felt pain and I had a plan to free this world of pain. Naruto cut him off right there. Oh, yeah? Genius, would you care to share? Because you have done a crack-up job thus far. I would unite the world in pain. By taking the biju I would create the ultimate weapon to end all war. The humans would be too scared to go to war because I would be able to end the war instantly with this weapon. Kami, bless it, you are stupid. Do you even know what happens when you unite all of the biju together? Was this even your idea? Finally, are you an Uzumaki? Pain stuttered at this. My name does not matter, I am just Pain. The biju unite to form the ultimate weapon. I worked with Madara. Conan and Zetsu to create this plan. Okay, let me ask you this, Pain Uzumaki. I locked on to your chakra and you are an Uzumaki. That red hair is a dead giveaway. Anyway, let me just say you are wrong. Let me tell you what really happens, according to Kyubi, Ichibi, Nibi, 
Gobi, Rokubi, Nanabai, Gobi and the Uchiha tablet. If you unite the Biju in the demonic statue of the outer paths, which is just the husk of the Jubi, you will reform the Jubi. The Jubi is beyond your control. It is beyond Madara's control. It is beyond anyone's control. If you completed your plan, at best case it would be the end of the world. At the worst case scenario, if our worst fears are to be believed, you will free the rabbit goddess from her prison and turn every human on the planet into some vegetable. Project Tsukuyami ring a bell? Pain visibly faltered at this. That was what Madara called the plan. Come to think of it, all pain, Yahiko and Conan wanted was to defend their homeland from the endless wars. They wanted to protect future generations and make sure that nobody was orphaned the way they were. When did that change? When I lost Yahiko? When Madara came into the picture? Yes, it had to be when he came in and took over the Akatsuki. I see that I am starting to break through that thick Uzumaki skull of yours. You have been manipulated pain. If you wanted peace, then why didn't you join me? If you wanted peace, why did you kill over 300 innocent people in Suna? It wasn't me that made the first attack in all of this. I simply reached out and united people behind a common goal. They came to me via their own volition. If you force a peace, then it will only last until someone is strong enough to revolt. If you rule through fear, your rule will only last until your people have nothing left to lose. Look at you and Hanzo. Pain was starting to break down. He was crying and holding the side of his head with his hands over his temples. He was whimpering, Yahiko, Conan, where did I go wrong? Naruto decided now was the time to take his shot. Look, Pain, you are an Uzumaki. You have family. I have found one other living Uzumaki, and I think a couple of them got caught up in all of this fighting. Tell me, Uzumaki-san, what is your name? It is Nagato, right? Pain looked up through tear-streaked eyes at the blonde kid in front of him. On Naruto's face he didn't find hatred or disgust, rather, he found caring, kindness and hope. Hope that no more lives had to be lost. Pain looked Naruto in the eye and nodded. So, not only are we family, but you are my senpai. I trained under Jiraiya too. Did you hear he finally married Tsunade? I inherited the dream of Jiraiya, my father, my mother and the Uzumaki clan. Each of them wished for me to find happiness and do everything I could to bring peace to the shinobi world. What? What do you mean? The Uzumaki clan was dead before you were even born. Did you ever go visit our homeland? Well, I did when I was twelve and that was what gave me the push to do everything I have done. In the Uzumaki vaults, Orisha Uzumaki, last Yuzukage of Whirlpool, left a final message to whichever ancestor was able to open the vaults. The clan asked for their ancestor to rebuild the clan and to forgive past grudges. That inspired me to reach out of Kumo and IWA. That is what gave me the courage to march forward on this crazy path to peace. Nagato's mind was clearing for the first time since he lost Conan. The haze of everything that happened after her loss never seemed to lift. Even after Kabuto did his operation and gave him his mobility back, the haze was still there. How does this boy do that? How does he bring so much light into the world? Nagato remained in a stunned silence while he marveled at his fellow Uzumaki. Finally, he spoke. Naruto, there is no redeeming what I have done. All I wish for is to join Conan and Yahiko in the afterlife at least once before Yami claims my soul. Naruto briefly flashed a gigawatt smile at his lost Uzumaki before he saddened a bit. Yeah, it would be a hard road to redemption, but every journey starts with a single step. If you help me, I will put in a good word with the Shinigami for you. A small smile flitted upon Nagato's face and tears brimmed at the bottom of the Rinnegan swirls. What would you have me do? For starters, the fake Madara and the Zetsu need to go. They have caused so much pain and suffering in this world. To help me do that, 
allow the evacuation of your civilians. Any shinobi that wishes to surrender will be imprisoned and given a fair trial. Unfortunately, this fight is going to happen. Help me avoid as much unnecessary loss of life as we can. At that moment, Nagato cried out in pain and half of his body seemed to be taken over by a shadow. As the darkness crept over the left side of Nagato's face, the likeness of some creature smiled eerily at Naruto. Tsk, Tsk, Pain Kun. After all we have done for you, you are just going to betray us? I think not. Your usefulness has run its course. It is time for you to complete your final task. Naruto began to dash forward until he was intercepted by Madara. The orange mask looked right into Naruto's eyes and the Mangekyo Sharingan spun behind the lone eye hole on the right side of the mask. I have a message for your master. I am coming for the Kyubi. Don't think this barrier will stop me. Zetsu, do it. Pain was grunting in effort as he struggled to resist the influence of the black Zetsu, but it was in vain. During the operation Kabuto did, he put in a failsafe that allowed Black Zetsu greater influence over Pain. Pain started forming hand seals and once he completed them, Black Zetsu called out, Ghetto Art of Rinne Rebirth, Madara Uchiha. Naruto's clone froze when he heard what was said and he screamed as Nagato's body fell lifeless onto the ground before his existence was ended and his memories were sent back to the original. Meanwhile, at the docks, people had started flooding to the docks to evacuate the doomed city of a megacore. The Naruto clones were effective at distributing their message and around the city there were four walking paths created by a collaboration earth jutsu. At the head of each path was a Naruto clone that was in sage mode and the clones were screening people for negative intentions. This was a fast process, but it was better than trying to cram people into small boats. The evacuated civilians were taken into the encampments and put in a temporary prison. Any shinobi that surrendered had his, her chakra sealed and was moved along with the civilians. The evacuation was going well and there were still massive crowds at the docks. People were frantically looking for a way out of the soon-to-be battlefield. Allied forces began to cross the land bridges and they were forming a protective perimeter around the crowds. Skirmishes originated at the docks between Allied and Coalition forces, but they were now taking place all over a megacore. The assault had not been called for, but Naruto requested protective details for the civilians that wished to evacuate. The Coalition forces realized they were losing their meat shields, but orders had not come down from their leaders yet. Thus, small pockets of resistance popped up around the edges of AIM. The evacuation was going well for the first 30 minutes until mass amounts of white zetsu began growing out of the ground, emerging from the lake and jumping onto the created land bridges. At 10.45 am on the final day, total chaos ensued. Due to the zetsus, allied forces were called to secure the land bridges. The allies were at a disadvantage while trying to protect the hectic civilian populace. When the white zetsu showed up, Naruto clones in sage mode began dashing around the battlefield. They tried to keep the civilians calm, but it was no use. The land bridges became stampedes of people, and the allied forces were forced to block off the connection. As Robert Burns once said, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. At 9.30 am, all encampments were ordered by Strategic HQ to begin evacuation efforts in response to the number of civilians gathered at the docks. Things were going well until 10.45 when a mass message was issued to the Allied forces that they were to cease evacuation efforts and retreat outside of the city perimeter. The land bridges that were created turned into massive earth domes that protected as many civilians as they could. Naruto clones laid out barrier seals on the docks in an attempt to protect the civilian populaces that were attempting to evacuate. It was the best command could come up with on such short notice and nobody knew what caused the white zetsu to turn on the AIM population. Naruto's shadow clone was dispelled at 10.40 am, and Naruto sorted through the memories. He quickly relayed what had happened and informed the command tent that the real Madara Uchiha had been resurrected. 
By 10.45 a.m., new orders were issued and Allied forces were to retreat to the nearest encampment. Naruto flashed into his golden cloak and created 100 Kurama-empowered clones to go and set up barriers to protect as many civilians as possible. According to the latest count, 35,000 civilians had been processed and detained within the encampments. Best estimates said that there were 20,000 more on the land bridges or docks. Naruto hoped his barriers would hold up against the Allied forces' next move. At 10.40 a.m. in the tower, Madara Uchiha opened his eyes to see nothing. He had removed his eyes before his death so when he told his brain to open his eyes, he wasn't surprised when Blackness answered him. He called out to Zetsu, who was by his side, and Black Zetsu transplanted Madara's Rinnegan. The operation was quick since they were Madara's eyes to begin with and Hashirama's cells increased his healing rate. By 10.45 a.m., Madara was given the state of current events and he ordered Black Zetsu to make the Zetsu army attack the civilian population while Black Zetsu brought Madara up to date. Abito watched his master's revival and felt the power that was Madara Uchiha. He knew that nothing was going to plan and only hoped that his master would show mercy on him despite his failures. When Madara opened his Rinnegan eyes, he knelt down and bowed to his master. He provided what updates he could and Madara sneered at him for all of his failures. If I had known my chosen subordinate was so completely useless, would have chosen a different apprentice. Do not disappoint me again, Abito, for I will not be so forgiving next time. Back in the command tent, Naruto was meditating and trying to control the Senjutsu Chakra. Every couple of minutes he would create ten clones that flashed out of the command tent in flares of golden energy. Naruto was trying to create a plan to deal with Madara that wouldn't involve the civilian population. At 10.55 am, Naruto's world seemed to freeze, and he felt the familiar presence of the Shinigami. He remained in his meditative posture as he addressed her. Good morning, Shin. It is good to see you again, but I am rather busy. I know, Naruto-kun. I know you are aware that Madara was brought back to the mortal realm. Those damned eyes should never have been granted to a mortal. Damned Izanami-chan never did think of the consequences to her actions. He does not belong in this realm, Naruto-kun. Bring him back to me. I. I don't know if I am strong enough, Shinchan. I mean, that is the real Madara Uchiha with the Rinnegan and he is holding thousands of people hostage. I believe in you, Naruto-kun. You have your friends and everyone behind you, including me. Shin leaned down and placed a kiss on Naruto's forehead. When she kissed him, Naruto felt an unfamiliar power enter his system. The power coursed through him and eased the strain on his chakra coils, overfilled his and Kurama's reserves and filled him with a sense of calm. Thanks Shin. I won't let you down. With those words, time unfroze, and the world started spinning again. Naruto rose from his meditative position in the command tent, and everyone looked to him for their orders. Commence operation by Jadama. The barriers I have placed will hold. We cannot let Madara reassimilate into his full form. I accept. Responsibility for everything, just give the order Inoichi. Inoichi nodded despite not being able to make contact with Naruto due to the massive headset he was wearing. Inoichi gave the order for all allied forces to prepare for impact and a direct mental command was sent to all Jinchuriki. Naruto jumped out of the tent and got ready to play his part. An overhead view of the battlefield would show eight massive chakra constructs emerging all over the battlefield. Each Jinchuriki was undergoing a full-tailed beast transformation and sinking with their biju. Each one of them hoped that they were doing the right thing because they knew the likely outcome of their actions. Golden blurs were streaking around the edge of a megacore and running through dark red barriers that surrounded thousands of civilians. As each chakra creature rose to its full height, black, red and blue energy began to coalesce in balls in front of each biju's mouth. Each biju and jinchuriki prayed to the sage and kami that they would be forgiven for what they were about to do. 
At 11 a.m., eight Baijadama ripped their way across the lake and headed toward the industrial city of Omegacore. Despite being 50 meters above the water, mass amounts of water were displaced, and massive wakes followed the path of the Baijadama toward the city. An eerie silence seemed to permeate throughout the barrier the moment before impact, then a massive roar echoed across Omegacore. The combined explosions of eight Baijadama made every ninja feel like an explosive tag just went off inside their ears. The ringing was deafening as multiple mushroom clouds fused into one and marked the city of Omegacore for death. The dust and debris hung heavy in the air around Omegacore. The mushroom cloud billowed into the atmosphere for what seemed like forever. Naruto told Inoichi that each biju was to evacuate the port nearest them and prepare for battle. Naruto could feel two ominous and powerful chakra signatures just biding their time in the dust cloud. Naruto blurred to the southern Omegacore dock and started to drop the barriers that were protecting the civilians. He could sense each individual person that remained alive, and he felt the great collection of souls that recently perished weighing heavily upon his conscience. Not now, Kit. Focus on what lay ahead. Those two pose a greater threat than any of us wish to admit at this time. Naruto didn't respond to Kurama's words, he just powered on with his task. Screaming was heard from all over the city as Omegacore civilians were panicking over the various biju that were scooping them up. Naruto and Kurama were snatching people with nine chakra tails that blurred in motion and flung people into the protective and semi-solid chakra of Naruto's biju transformation. Gara and Shikaku were scooping civilians into sand-constructed flying carpets and Shikaku was cackling madly the whole time. Unfortunately, one mentally unstable aim civilian decided to jump. Off the side of the sand carpet instead of risking whatever the crazed Tanuki wanted with him. Matatabi and Yujito stole Naruto and Q's idea and many aim civilians passed out when they thought that they were about to be incinerated. It made the ride back to safety more bearable for Matatabi. Sun Goku and Rashi in their massive lava ape transformation were piling the civilians onto Sun Goku's back and the giant ape was lambasting the necessity of allowing humans to touch his magnificent and royal figure. Kokuo and Han worked quickly and quietly as Kokuo scooped civilians up by the dozens and placed them on his back. Kokuo became a blur of blue-gray movement as he dashed back and forth across the Lake of Aim. Seiken and Yudakata worked to transport the civilians in bubbles across the lake and it looked like a three-year-old just got a hold of a bubble machine on the eastern side of Aim. Fu and Chomei worked in tandem to fly people from Aim to safety and finally B and Gyuki were swimming back and forth in the Lake of Aim with untold numbers of civilians stuck to the sticky suction cups of the eight-tailed octopus. Before the dust fully cleared, civilians were evacuated, and the stage was set for a battle of epic proportions. Naruto issued the order that only Shrank Shinobi and above may enter this fight, which was supported by all other Kage and commanders. Before Naruto completed committed to that fight though, he saw that an onslaught of white Zetsu were attacking each encampment. It felt like twenty to thirty thousand white Zetsu just appeared out of nowhere. He passed command to Shikaku Nara as he and the other elite fighters dashed toward the island of Aim to take on the greatest threat of all time. Madara was impressed at the might of the Biju and their ultimate attack. To crack his ultimate Susano was no small feat and he could tell that none of the Baijadama even made direct contact with him. He looked to his left at the slightly panicked form of Abito and tisked at him. For an Uchiha to not be able to form their own Susano was pathetic, but he served his purpose. Well, Abito, you may not have collected the proper biju ahead of time, but it seems like these fools brought them to me. You will fight alongside me, and this is the last time I will save you. Go forth and enjoy the bloody dance of battle. Abito nodded inside of Madara's Susano in reverence to his master. As you wish, Madara-sama. Just as Abito ejected himself from Madara's Susano, a mighty wind swept across the battlefield that cleared the ash and dust from the air. A force of allied Shibobi stood behind eight biju that were fully transformed and rearing for a fight. Naruto, B, Fu, Yudakata, Han, Rashi, 
Yujito, and Gara synchronized with their biju and were assigned the great task of eliminating a reincarnated Madara Uchiha. Hiruzen, Sasuke, Kakashi, Anko, who adamantly refused to let her man do all of the fighting for her, Itachi, Shursue, A, Derui, Shur, Kitsuchi, Anoki. Who refused to let his old rival one-up him in his retirement, Akatsuchi, Kuratsuchi, who followed Anko's example and threatened to melt Naruto's family jewels should he deny her, Kankuro, Baki, Tamari, troublesome woman, Chojuro, Mei, Haku, why did Naruto marry so many troublesome women, Zabuza and Aiake Ringo, descendant of the previous swordswoman of the mist, were the frontline support. It was a great collection of the best shinobi from around the elemental nations that could provide mid to long range support for what was sure to be an insane fight. Naruto, being Naruto, led things off. Madara, Shinigami sama told me that you had escaped. It never ceases to amaze me how low scum like you will go to drag the earth into ruin. Hn, and who might you be? I am Naruto fucking Uzumaki Namikaze and I am the supreme commander of the allied shinobi forces, uniters of nations, Jinchuriki of the biggest badass of all time and Adonis of the sheets. Tell ya, what, Madara, play nice and I will give you a one-on-one. -on -one. Hn, you are centuries too young to step to me, boy. Madara flashed his EMS at Karama and ordered him to come. Naruto barked out a deep and menacing laughter. You think you could take my soul-bonded partner with your monkey marbles? Bitch please. The fact that a forty-story fox made of chakra was throwing insults liberally at the acknowledged strongest ninja of all time made the ally forces sweat drop. However, along with the sweat drops came a substantial boost to their confidence and morale in the face of this legend. The sounds of battle and jutsu raged from all around the lake as the white zetsu forces engaged with the allied shinobi. Naruto was getting updates from Inoichi through his mental link and knew that his people could handle the damned plant monster. Madara became visibly frustrated at the disrespect this boy was showing him and was about to draw the four swords of the perfect Susano before he saw markings creeping up the sides of each transformed biju. The markings were all different shapes and colors but they all said one thing, sage mode, bitches. Madara felt the further strengthening of these monsters and his blood began to boil. His lust for battle overtook him and a crazed smile appeared on his face. Surely not even his fight against Hashirama would push him as hard as eight of the biju, especially eight biju in sage mode. Naruto gave the mental command to his allies to step back and let the biju handle the opening part of the battle. Until Madara's Susano was broken, only Ai, Tsunade, Itachi, Shursue, Sasuke and Anoki would provide support. The scale of the battle would be too great to risk allied shinobi in the crossfire. Naruto and Kurama stomped a paw on the ground and another massive barrier that was tinged a dark red sprung up around the island of Aim. Shikaku stomped a paw on the ground and a massive sand rampart was constructed for the allied shinobi to spread out on and provide support. During these preparations, Madara drew the four swords of Susano and began to prepare a swing. Abito panicked not being able to use his Kamui ability and not being able to transform into the Susano. He panicked until he summoned the Sanbai and stood on top of its head. His smirk lasted all of two seconds when he was assaulted by three stage three Susanos. Itachi and Shursue drove the Sanbai back to the other side of the island and over half of the allied shinobi present disappeared to support the fight between Uchihas. It should be noted that the battle arena was just over three square miles, the total area of the island of Aim. As two different battles roared to life on the island, the allied forces were fighting valiantly against the army of White Zetsu. The initial battle was a massacre of the white creatures due to Earth-style shinobi hardening the earth and preventing Zetsu's subterranean travel. Thus, the Zetsu were forced to emerge from ten meters inside the lake's edge. Much like the charge on Omaha Beach, Zetsu after Zetsu fell and piled on top of the other as they trudged their way through the waist-deep water. The fact that Zetsu didn't bleed was a mercy for the allied shinobi otherwise there would have been enough blood leaked into the lake to dye it red. 
The remainder of the Kanoha 12 fought side by side with their Kanoha compatriots to deal death upon the white freaks of the Akatsuki. Tsum kept Kiba on a leash because the overeager pup was about to break battle lines to charge at the Zetsu army. Hana smacked her brother on his head to reinforce her mother's point. The only hope to prevent wide-scale confusion was to maintain the battle lines and prevent white Zetsu from transforming into allied forces. In order to ensure this, shinobi were divided into foreman squads that bore seal tags that linked their chakra. Even if Zetsu transformed into an ally, the other three would be able to identify it as an intruder. Shikamaru Nara was most definitely a genius for devising this battlefield strategy. Niji and half of the Hyuga, Rock Lee, Might Guy, the Inazukas, the Akimichi and various other close combat fighters were the wall of death that the Zetsu would need to penetrate if they wished to enter Kanoha's territory. Mid-range Jutsu users were positioned directly behind them and raised on an earthen rampart to provide elemental support. The last line of offense was the weapons users composed of Tenten, the Hyuga Bowman, the Yamanaka and other long-range types. The formation proved devastating and not a single white Zetsu was able to penetrate the front line of the Kanoha defense. Similar battle configurations were found at all eight encampments and the slaughter of the white Zetsu lasted for a full three hours. Back with Madara, he was stopped from swinging his Susano swords by a charge from Kokuo that set him off balance and stumbling backward. Gyuki took advantage of this and lashed out with Senjutsu reinforced tentacles to trip the massive. Purple Chakra Construct Madara was able to prevent a total collapse as he made the Susano drop to one knee, spin on its arm and come up with a slash that sent Son Goku flying. Chomei performed a flyby and dropped an enormous veil of scale powder down on the partially immobilized Susano. Saiken launched acidic globs at the earth under Madara to soften it and corrode away his foundation. Matatabi sent one massive blue fireball after another at the purple enemy, which ignited the scale powder and caused a massive explosion. Kurama and Naruto formed nine Senjutsu Odama Raisin Shuriken, one in each tail, and hurled them at Madara's Susano. Madara was an ancient and powerful shinobi. In the past, there was only one man that could claim to be his equal. For his perfect form to struggle against such pests was unthinkable to him. He sustained blow after blow and was struggling to sense anything with the blinding obstructions and the enormous amounts of residual chakra on the battlefield. However, when he was forced to his knee and unable to get up, he sensed it. The battle-hardened shinobi sensed chakra so dense that it could be sensed around the elemental nations and there were nine points of focus. Before Madara could come up with a substantial defense, his Susano was ripped apart by nine jutsu of astronomic power. The nine wind domes fused into one massive wind maelstrom that was nearly half a kilometer wide. The windstorm composed of billions of atomic wind blades eroded the Susano down and ate away at the chakra that composed it. Naruto and Kurama were huffing and puffing after that collaboration attack, as were the other transformed biju. They gained a bit of distance and let their support forces bombard the location with a variety of powerful jutsu. The Jinchuriki dropped their transformations and each of them sank into meditative postures to cool down their chakra pathways and prepare for the next stage of the battle. The light show of jutsu continued to fly overhead of the meditating Jinchuriki for a whole two minutes until a massive chakra explosion drew their attention to the massive crater. Each Jinchuriki rose with their sage mode active and formed two clones apiece to continue to gather the natural energy that now hung thick in the battle environment. Madara was in pain, so much pain. That wind attack had eaten away his Susano and only the Papreta path was able to save Madara from complete annihilation. Luckily, the allied jutsu that began to pepper his location didn't do much damage to him and he was able to absorb some of the attacks. The absorbed chakra worked well with Hashirama's cells to rapidly heal his wounds and allowed him to continue the fight. He was finally able to stand on his feet and declared that enough was enough as he sent out a chakra blast to halt the incoming jutsu. He looked up and noticed he was in a crater that was nearly 200 meters deep. 
In fact, it was so deep that water began pouring into the crater. Which made Madara ride the water to fifty or so meters below the rim of the newly formed crater. He looked up from his new position with a cocky smirk on his face as eleven figures appeared over the edge and peered down on him. Unfucking believable! muttered Naruto as he saw Madara standing there. Indeed, Naruto kun! answered Hiruzen. Yo, yo, this Madara fool ain't such a tool. Hit can take a hit just like Master B can spit. Enough, B. Serious mode, brother. AI said as he activated his lightning cloak. Okay, guys. No holding back. Let's take it to him close range. Give me an opportunity to seal him. Aim for the eyes, we need those Rinnegan out of the picture. Naruto said. Madara laughed madly at the futile resistance that these mere humans were putting up. He was a god, and it was about time he showed it to these mortals. Madara performed some hand signs, bit his finger and slammed his hand on the ground. A measly puff of smoke was all he got for his efforts. He looked up to see the infuriating smirk of that damnable blonde. What have you done to the ghetto Mazo? He screamed in fury. Naruto's smirk grew to encompass his whole face and he rubbed his index finger in mock pride under his nose. Ain't tellin' ya. You and your little statue of doom need some time apart. Madara's chakra flared, and he held up one hand and called out, Bansho Tenen and Naruto was ripped off of his feet and flew like a ragdoll toward Madara. Naruto's surprise didn't last too long, and he spun in mid-air to right himself. He saw Madara's arm transform into some blade that looked like a messed up, eight-pronged trident. The monstrosity looked like it would skewer Naruto, but Naruto created a shadow clone mid-flight to substitute with him and take his place. Madara was enraged further, and he dashed forward to impale Naruto with the bladed arm. Han stopped him mid-stride with a rapid kick that let out a gout of steam upon impact. Madara screamed as the steam burned his arm before he was struck from all sides by Senjutsu-enhanced Jinchuriki. Infuriated by these flies that were actually inflicting significant damage on him, Madara roared out, Shinra Tensei. The attack was infused with massive amounts of chakra, and it sent the Jinchuriki, the water in the crater and debris flying in random directions. Luckily, Sage Mode heavily fortifies the bodies of each Jinchuriki, so they only sustained minor damage, but now they were scattered. Madara appeared next to Yudakata and drove a fist covered in lightning through his right shoulder. Yudakata screamed out in pain as Madara attempted a killing blow. Naruto flashed in front of Madara, deflected his lightning-covered fist and lashed out with a right cross that catapulted Madara into the far side of the crater. Naruto created a clone to evacuate Yudakata to the back lines to receive medical healing. Madara's head was spinning. The Kyubi Jinchuriki sure packed a punch and it infuriated Madara further. Why didn't? Shinra Tensei, activate when I tried at that time? Hmm, I will need to test it further. Madara's reflections were cut short as he was forced to deal with another bombardment of Senjutsu hardened fists and kicks. Getting frustrated, Madara called on his power once again and this time another magnificent burst of gravity escaped him and sent his opponents flying. However, it seemed like the Kyubi Jinchuriki and the flying girl found a way to mitigate his attack. Naruto was picking up on Madara's attack sequence and if his hunch was right he wouldn't be able to use that Shinra Tensei, Tina Magager again for a few seconds. Naruto sent a verbal command to Fu to attack Madara first and he would follow up. After their 1-2, which Madara was able to parry both blows with minimal damage, Killer B and AI appeared in a burst of speed and caught Madara in a double lariat decapitation technique. Madara's instinctual activation of the stage 1 Susano was the only thing that saved his life during that attack. Despite the spectral ribcage coming to his defense, Madara coughed up a lungful of blood from that impact. A I and B jumped back at that point to reset the fight and get further instructions from Naruto. Back in the Battle of the Uchihas, 
Itachi and Shursui performed combination attacks with their Susano forms to drive Abito and the Sanbai back in a very ungraceful stumble. The massive turtle protected its summoner from most of the damage, but it could not gain the initiative. Not only were sword swings and shield bashes hitting its hardened shell, but arrows were flying in the gap between attacks to constantly keep Abito and the Sanbai under control. The massive turtle bellowed out a mighty roar as an arrow sunk into its exposed belly. Abito appeared to yank on a purple, ethereal chain of chakra that surrounded the Sanbai's neck to get it back under his control. Abito took position in the turtle's mouth and the turtle rolled into a ball of hardened armor. The turtle began spinning and deluges of water sprayed out from its sides as it rolled across the destroyed terrain. It looked like the armadillo god of the league, Ramus, spinning its way across the battlefield with water geysers that acted like the blades of a chariot to cut its foes down. Unfortunately for the Sanbai, the Susano forms of the Uchiha brothers were more than enough for the Sanbai. Itachi's Susano crouched low as the turtle hurled itself his way. As the turtle impacted his shield, Itachi performed a mighty jump thrust that sent the spinning turtle flying into the air. Sasuke landed a three-shot combo of Susano arrows empowered by the flames of Susano, Amaterasu, on the turtle's tail. The biju roared out in pain as the black flames began eating away at its tails. Shursui followed up with bisecting sword slices. The mighty blue blades of Shursui's Susano impacted simultaneously on the sides of the massive turtle and sent chunks of its shell flying everywhere as the blades dug into its hardened chakra flesh. Abito was on the back foot. Normally, he would use his Kamui ability to create opening and avoid enemy attacks. Now, he was unable to activate the ability and he knew it had something to do with this cursed barrier. Before he could figure it out, his whole city was leveled, and he was forced into this fight. Now, he was separated from his master and at a clear disadvantage against his traitorous Uchiha brethren. He felt the black Zetsu crawl on his arm and deliver a message. Abito, hurry up and finish your fight. If you cannot beat those weaklings, do not bother showing yourself before me. That is what Madara said. Oh, and that white Zetsu army we have spent the better part of two decades creating is getting decimated. If you don't hurry up and end this fight you will have to fight the whole allied force. Damn it, why doesn't master call in the ghetto Mazo? Surely, the great beast could destroy this barrier. He tried and he cannot summon it. After analyzing the barrier, it is a masterpiece of Fuenjutsu. It prevents all space-time techniques and it draws on chakra from all those inside it to power itself. There are eight focal points that are holding it up, but they are well guarded. Black Zetsu said in a gravely and irritated tone. Fuck. Well, Sanbai is on its last leg, useless fucking turtle. Can I count on your assistance? Black Zetsu sighed as it melded into Abito's left half. The part of Abito that was composed of Hashirama's white goop was now covered by Black Zetsu. It provided a significant power surge to Abito and would be necessary for the next part of this fight. As Sanbai almost died, Abito pulled it back into himself with the purple chains. It was rather disturbing for the Uchiha brothers to witness a giant turtle pulled into a human being. Well, Itachi, Sasuke, Shursui and Kakashi. Long time no see to my old ex-friend. Abito said with a torturous tone as he removed his mask. He was counting on some psychological torture to take out one of his opponents. Oh 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 be. Abito. How? Kakashi stammered out as he gaped at his supposedly dead friend. Oh, you know. Typical story. I sacrifice myself for my friend and ask him to do one thing. One kami damn thing. Protect Rin. Then guess what happens? I finally recover with the aid of Madara Uchiha and the first thing I see when I go looking for my old friends is you putting a Chidori through Rin's heart. So, don't stand there acting all high and mighty, Kakashi Hitaki. You did this. Everything I do is to create a world with Rin in it. 
Sasuke chuckled lowly. You are pathetic. An Uchiha losing himself to despair over one girl when you could have come back to the support of our entire fucking clan. Sasuke's Susano grew from stage 3 and was now fully armored and stood 50 feet higher. Calm down, Ototo. This pathetic excuse of an Uchiha isn't worth getting riled up over. Itachi's monotone cut across the battlefield and had the simultaneous effect of calming Sasuke and enraging Abito. Shursue barked out a laugh. So, cousin, you betrayed our clan and tried to incite a coup de tat in order to do what? Get a girl back that never loved you? I remember Rin, she would always swoon over Kakashi, and you would rant non-stop about it. Get a hold of yourself. You are an embarrassment to the Uchiha. The bashing of Abito had the side effect of breaking Kakashi from his depression and Kakashi activated his EMS. Abito, you have strayed from the path. The Kyubi attack, the Uchiha rebellion, the bloodline purge in Kiri, and Kami knows what else. For Rin's sake, I will put an end to your torturous existence. Unfortunately, I have recently become acquainted with the Shinigami, and she will most definitely send you to Yami to feast upon your soul. Abito shuddered at the thought before rage overtook him and he launched himself at Kakashi. Kakashi parried a right cross and jumped the leg sweep. He lashed out with an airborne mule kick that threw Abito back and Kakashi back flipped to land ten feet away on his feet. Itachi, Shursue, and Sasuke let their Susanos dissolve and drew their katanas. Each of their weapons enhanced by Uzumaki chakra flared to life. Sasuke and Itachi's katanas became encased in dense lightning chakra while Shursue sheathed his blade in fire. Abito drew out a katana and Madara's gunbai fan to repel their attacks. The masterclass Kenjutsu fight lasted for the next ten minutes with the Uchiha brothers and Kakashi swarming around Abito. Abito and Black Zetsu sustained significant damage, which Zetsu tried to heal with Hashirama's cells. However, the damage was too great, and the chakra drain on Abito was taking its toll. The allied Uchiha jumped back and flipped through hand signs as Kakashi performed one more distracting attack. In unison, the three brothers called out, Katan, Majestic Flame Annihilation. From three sides, great and expanding waves of flame collapsed on a panting Abito. Abito flipped through seals and called out, Mokutan, Great Forest Emergence. As Abito slammed his hands on the ground, chakra-reinforced trees sprouted out of the ground on all sides and rushed to meet the deadly flames. Once the dust and ash cleared, a burned forest remained and a heavily singed Abito was on one knee in the middle of the destruction. Shursue used his lightning-fast speed to appear behind Abito and he attempted to place a ceiling tag on Abito. As Abito spun, Itachi and Sasuke appeared on either side of Abito's back and each of the slapped a chakra lock ceiling tag. Sasuke's tag happened to land on Abito's left arm, which was encased in black zetsu. As the tags engaged, Abito collapsed, and the black half of his body seemed to melt off of him. Sasuke saw this and performed an Uzumaki seal, evil containment seal, on the black puddle. Kanji began to surround the black zetsu and it began sucking the puddle into the sphere of kanji. Rather than disappear into a ceiling tag, the kanji hovered in midair as the black zetsu creature was completely sucked into the glowing blow sphere of kanji. The creature's shrill screams of a mother and kagaya-sama ceased as the kanji imploded in on itself. Everyone present looked at each other with shock and disgust in their eyes at what they just witnessed, the end of Black Zetsu. Abito lay on his back, motionless and panting for breath as the Uchiha brothers and Kakashi stood over him. Naruto's influence had kept their rage tempered and their lust for revenge sated for so many years, but nothing could stop them now. Sasuke took his katana and severed Abito's left arm from the shoulder down. He stabbed his blade into the joint and twisted it slowly and persistently until the unnatural, white arm separated from its host. Shursue took the right arm, but he started by severing fingers, then hand, then forearm, all the way up to Abito's shoulder. He cauterized the wound at the shoulder to prevent him bleeding out. 
Itachi simply severed his right leg in one clean slash and turned away from the screaming and defeated Uchiha. Kakashi had tears falling freely from his eyes at the memory of his best friend. He had spent so much time apologizing to Abito at the memorial stone that he had honestly lost count. If Naruto hadn't saved him then he would likely have become some washed up, no good teacher that read porn instead of teaching his students. Kakashi wiped tears from his eyes as he spoke to his fallen friend. Abito, not a day went by that I didn't think of you, Rin and Sensei. You killed Sensei, Abito. You chose to remain in the dark so to darkness I will send you. As a last favor, I will petition Naruto to ask the Shinigami to let you see Rin once more before you perish in Yami's domain. I. I. I regret. Nothing. Except. Trusting. You. With. Rin. Abito struggled out the defiant last words of a fool through panting breath. His whole world was pain, and the darkness was creeping in upon the edges of his vision. At this point, he would welcome the sweet release of death. I'm sorry. Did you say something? Kakashi broke the tension of the moment as he concentrated on the bit of earwax his left pinky finger had dug out of his ear. Damn. You. Kakashi. Kakashi took his blade and plunged it into Abito's heart. He ignited the blade in lightning chakra to ensure a definitive end to his old friend's life. Kakashi sighed and let go of the blade before he fell to his knees and began to weep. Itachi and Sasuke moved to comfort their senpai. Shursue simply looked up at the sky and prayed to his fallen ancestors. A look of serenity was on his face as he realized his clan was finally avenged and could find peace in the pure world. Sasuke helped Kakashi to his feet as Itachi closed his eyes and sent a mental update to Inoichi. Inoichi-san, the fake Madara, is dead. Lower the outer barrier and let Naruto free. Understood, Itachi. Stand by. Thirty seconds later, the Barrier around the whole lake dissipated and a mental update came in through Inoichi. Barrier down. Rejoin Naruto and finish this. Understood. Back with Naruto and the Jinchuriki. Madara had finished coughing up blood as he looked at the fourteen ninjas that stood in defiance of him. He thought about how his plans had fallen apart and how he was not resurrected at full strength. Pain was supposed to use the Ghetto Mazo with all Biju sealed inside it, to power his resurrection and make him stronger than ever. However, this pest, this Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, obstructed his plans at every turn. This resulted in him being resurrected at his old power level, rather than the power level of a god. The damage he sustained from the attacks was significant, but it was nothing he couldn't heal away with time and a bit of chakra. He needed time to restore his chakra and bring out his Susano once again. Tell me, boy, tell me why you resist my plan? With the infinite Tsukuyami I could bring everlasting peace to the world. Because you're an idiot, that's why. If you sealed all Biju back inside that statue, you resurrect the Jubi. That is not something you could control. Naruto's tone was snide and derisive. Even if you could control it, I doubt your plan based on ancient Uchiha texts would work. Not to mention a peace achieved by robbing humanity of its free will is not peace. It is slavery. Foolish boy. A mere brat could never understand. Oh, can it, you old fossil. I am the agent of Shinigami in this mortal realm. She tasked me with returning your soul to her. She was quite upset that you managed to escape. She is going to have fun torturing you with Yami. You think you can kill me, boy? I am a god amongst men. Naruto cut him off right there. You are no god. You are a man-child playing at being a god. At that moment, Naruto saw the blue barrier shimmer out of existence. He had gotten the mental update from Inoichi and that was all he was waiting for. It is time to end this. Naruto drew out Whirlpool's Edge and Heaven's Rampart and flashed into his golden cloak. 
Madara took out some kunai and took a defensive posture. Madara heard the whisper of flying Raijin, Hiration, third step, before he was surrounded in flashes of gold. Each flash was accompanied by multiple slashes of wind-enhanced swords. The Madara that was in front of Naruto transformed into cuts of fine wooden splinters, but the golden flashes didn't stop there. In Sage Kyubi mode, Naruto could sense exactly where every copy of Madara was. Golden flashes splashed across the battlefield as multiple wood clones of Madara were ended. When the golden light show ceased, Madara was on his knees behind the allied ninja that bore witness to Naruto's final attack. Madara was cut to pieces. He was missing both hands, each arm severed at the elbow. He had several deep gashes that ran the length of his torso, and it looked like the face of Hashirama that was over his heart had been completely stabbed through. Madara was kneeling on stumps for legs as the twin swords kept him in an upright position. Madara's face were twin streams of blood as there was a horizontal slash just deep enough to destroy the Rinnegan eyes. The blood poured freely out of his eye sockets and Madara coughed up multiple mouthfuls of blood. I have nothing to say to a dead man. Naruto said as he bit his thumb and summoned the Shinigami. Shin came in her mortal attire, terrifying mask with rotten teeth bitten into the hilt of a knife. The billowing white robe of the Shinigami and the unkept white hair flew about in the wind, even though the whole mortal realm was stilled. The Shinigami spoke for all to hear and her voice was full of frigid rage. Madara Uchiha, you dare to defy me and escape my realm. For your transgressions, your soul is to be devoured and snuffed out. Yami will join me in my feast. Repent, mortal, for claiming yourself a god. The Shinigami plucked the knife from her mouth and plunged it into Madara's chest, between Naruto's swords. An ethereal soul could be seen traveling through the blade until the Shinigami brought the blade to her mouth and swallowed it. The existence that was once Madara Uchiha ceased to be. The Shinigami turned to Naruto and bowed politely to her champion and the only mortal she has ever loved. Naruto-kun, you have done me another great service. As is custom, I owe you a favor. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly before he got down on his knees and prostrated himself to the Shinigami. Shin, I know I ask too much. I will continue to serve you for the rest of my life. I ordered the attack on the city. I ordered that. Fits of tears broke Naruto's address to the Shinigami. If. If it is possible. Could you revive the souls that I claimed? It wasn't meant to be this way. They were innocent. If not for Madara, I would not have ordered that attack. The Shinigami seemed to think for a bit. The air hung still in a frigid silence as Shin decided whether or not her love was asking too much of her. Eventually, she sighed. Naruto-kun, I will do you this favor if you agree to serve alongside me after your mortal life. Alongside you? Naruto looked up with tear-streaked eyes. A sight that made Shin's heart break. Yes, you will become my king of death once your mortal life has ended. What of my wives and family? He asked hesitantly. They can take positions in my court. I have grown fond of them, and I am sure your ancestors will be of similar caliber. Shin answered in a dismissive manner, as if waving off his concerns. Does that mean that you will marry me? Naruto asked and his depressed mood was replaced with a gigawatt smile. The Shinigami visibly swooned and known only to her she squealed like a schoolgirl in her mind. Finally, Shin could no longer restrain herself and she transformed into the visage of beauty itself. She ran to Naruto, picked him up off his knees and planted a literally soul-searing kiss onto him. Later, Naruto would find out that the Shinigami used that kiss to join their existences, which imparted him with even more power. Yes, Naruto-kun. I will be yours, and you mine, for eternity. Shin said in an enchanting and happy voice. Naruto scooped Shin into his arms and spun her around in happiness. Fu, B, Gara, Han, Rashi, Yudakata, Yujito, 
Ai, Hiruzen and everyone else watching had their jaws on the ground. A seal-less shadow clone popped into existence, unsealed Naruto's camera and began taking a hilarious series of pictures. They were each struggling to process the fact that their leader successfully courted the goddess of death, on top of nine other women. This story would become legend. The legend of Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, Godame Hokage, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, Second Elemental Flash, Luckiest Bastard in the Universe, Bringer of Peace, Merciful Master and Future King of Death. After the scene ripped right out of a romance novel, Shin asked Naruto to look away. She admitted that she didn't want him to see her doing this. He gave her a chaste kiss on the lips before turning around and closing his eyes. The beautiful figure of the Shinigami clutched the purple prayer beads to her chest and her whole figure glowed silver. Her jaw seemed to unhinge and green wisps of light darted out of her mouth. Thousands of green, ethereal orbs darted all across a megacore and wherever a green orb landed, a human rose from the chaos left on the battlefield. In total, 15,000 people stood looking around at the darting green orbs and they were completely befuddled. They died with their city intact and a sense of doom hanging over the battlefield, but they rose with their city destroyed and massive craters littered their former home. They stood in stunned states wondering what was going on until a massive, golden orange fox seemed to rise out of nowhere. They all noticed the golden fox with nine swishing tails that seemed to have two humanoid figures in the centerpiece of its head. Era, era, Karamakun, this is a pleasant feeling. May I dine on some of your chakra? Shin said in a flirty and teasing tone. A massive sweat drop formed on the massive chakra fox as Karama responded. Shin-sama, please don't. I am already exhausted after this battle and the kit's chakra network is already strained enough. Oh, Karama-kun, you worry too much. Naruto cut Shin off with another kiss that made her blush. Enough, Shin-chan. Next time you visit we will prepare a chakra feast for you. For now, we must address these people before mass hysteria breaks out. Karama's fox head peered around the torn landscape at the people that were recently revived. Karama used his form to project Naruto's message across the landscape. The red barrier faded, and the allied forces were able to witness their leader's closing address for this war. People of Omega Corps and Osato and the remnants of the coalition forces, I am here. Today not as a god of war, but as a messenger of peace. I seek no more death nor destruction today. I have dealt with the leadership of the Akatsuki and the false god this nation worshipped. At these words, a very confused Nagato peered up at his estranged cousin. I do not seek to dominate you nor rule over you. I do not know what you were told by your previous leadership, but this war only started because the Akatsuki preyed on your fear of the Great Five uniting. If you do not believe my words, you are free to visit Hoshi, River, Kusa and Odo that have been peacefully occupied by the Allied forces for the better part of the last two months. Naruto paused here and squeezed Shin's hand as she stood next to her future husband and king. If you are wondering what happened today, thank this beautiful lady standing next to me. I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, champion of the Shinigami and soul-bound partner of Kurama the Kyubi no Kitsune. Madara and Abito Uchiha forced the battle to start while they were still hiding behind you, the innocent people of Omega Corps. I did my best to protect as many people as I could from our initial attack, but those of you here were caught in the attack. For the last three hours, you have been dead. By the grace of Shinigami-sama, she spared your souls and gave you a second chance at life. There was a deafening collective gasp from the crowd as they processed the news. Mutterings and shouts of denial sprang up from the crowd until Shin floated over them and flared her presence. What my future king tells you is true. Do not defy my love or I will revoke the kindness he showed you. Her ethereal voice with a tinge of anger carried across the battlefield. Immediately the crowd silenced itself and an uneasy aura settled over the battlefield. Look, everyone, it has been a long day. I understand that you are confused and that you have probably lost everything you owned. 
I will not apologize for destroying your homes and possessions, but I will offer you assistance and a path forward. We will set up relief camps and we will help you find new homes. This land is beyond repair and I will not allow the city of Omegacore to be rebuilt as a cautionary tale to future generations that would try to destroy the peace we are establishing. For now, please follow one of the land bridges to set up at one of the relief camps. I will talk with the leaders of each nation to help you find a new home and a new life. Thank you for listening to me and thank you for your future aid in bringing peace to the elemental nations. After his address was complete, Naruto dropped his Kurama transformation and settled on the ground with Shin. He locked his azure blue eyes with her magnificent silver orbs. Shin-chan, can I ask one more favor of you for one of my few remaining cousins? Shin smiled regally at him and nodded her head. Could you revive Conan, one of Nagato's only friends? I killed her in Sunigakor a while back and I want to make a peace offering moving forward. Era, era, Naruto-kun, such a big favor to ask. Shin put a playful finger on her chin and a mischievous smile played across her lips. Hmm. I think the price for such a favor is one night of my choosing in my realm where you will fulfill any desire I may or may not have. Naruto smirked and kissed his newest fiancé. Shin made one of her prayer beads glow and before he knew it Conan was standing in front of him. She was incredibly confused by what was going on and she tensed and jumped into a battle stance as she processed Naruto's visage. Now, now, Conan-chan, is that any way to treat somebody that just revived you and Nagato? Naruto's tone was playful and diffusing. Conan's eyes widened and her lips began to tremble. Wah! What did you do to Nagato? Naruto sighed and ran a hand through his dirty and clumped hair. Conan, a lot has happened. Let's go find Nagato so that I can sit you two down and explain things. Conan gave Naruto a cautious nod and Naruto let his allies know what he was going to do. They were all still gobsmacked by him flirting with and kissing the death goddess. Naruto gave a quick kiss to Shin before she returned to her realm. Shin's heart fluttered each time Naruto kissed her and she was reluctant to go back to her realm without him. Is it wrong that she wanted Naruto to hurry up and die? Anyway, Naruto put a hand on Conan's shoulder and used a joint shunshin to transport them next to Nagato. Nagato was confused as he watched the intrepid blonde address his people. People all around him recognized him and looked to him for guidance. The ringed eyes that he had grown accustomed to were now a deep violet. He was addressing his people when a swirl of wind announced that somebody just appeared next to him via a shunshin. Nagato turned around and then his jaw hit the floor and he dropped to his knees in disbelief. The one he loved most in the world, last light in his life, the one he had lost, the most beautiful woman in the world to him was standing next to his previous enemy. Tears flowed freely out of the deep violet eyes and in a choked and cracked voice, he spoke. K.K. Ko. Conan. How? How are you alive? Conan rushed to Nagato and dropped to her knees to embrace him in a hug. Her blue hair rubbed against Nagato's face and made for a tender embrace. I. I don't know, she whispered. Naruto coughed into his hand, which broke the tender moment and brought their attention to him. A crowd had gathered around and was now listening in. Look guys, would you just accept that I am awesome, and I forgive you? Nagato cocked his head to the side and Conan just looked at him like he was stupid. Naruto sighed before he continued. Okay, look, Nagato is one of my last remaining relatives. I almost had him on my side before that Zetsu motherfucker took control of his body and revived Madara. We have won the war. We have united the elemental nations. I chose to show mercy today and basically... Sold my soul for eternity, admittedly it was to a woman I love, in order to revive all of these people. All that I ask is that you give me a chance. Join me in sustaining this peace and bringing prosperity to the elemental nations. Help me bring happiness to as many men, women and children as we can. That is all I ask in return for bringing you two back. 
Nagato looked pensive and Conan was looking at him bug-eyed. Conan chose to speak. You are not going to charge us for our crimes against you? You would allow us to live in peace? Meh, you are family and I know some people. We may not be able to have you guys in any major city, but I think I could set up a nice little house for you two on Yuzushiagakor to live out your days in peace. Why? Was the one-word question from Nagato. I told you, cuz, you are family. I forgave IWA, Kyumo and Kiri for destroying Yuzu. My wife forgave Kyumo for trying to kidnap her. IWA, for the most part, forgave my father for decimating over 1,000 men. I am not looking to dwell on the past. I can feel your hearts, Nagato and Conan. I know that all you desire is peace, so join me and help me. It is within our grasp. Set up on Yuzushio and start to rebuild it. I am sure many people will wish to join you in time and I would love to see my home rebuilt. Nagato stood on shaky legs and pulled Naruto into a hug while repeatedly whispering two words, thank you. Conan joined the hug and thanked Naruto as well. Naruto told them to join their people and he would get in touch with them later. When they asked how, Naruto tossed a familiar three-pronged kanai to them. That night a massive celebration was held in the relief camp and the allied encampments. The fourth great shinobi war was over, and everyone chose to listen to Naruto. Sure, the peace would be shaky at first, but at least every nation on the continent was moving in the right direction. Naruto partied with the Kanoha 12, his strategic council, the Kages, his wives, and many of the troops he had the honor of leading throughout the war. It was a joyous night and the party carried into a beautiful sunset that crept over the lake. The sun shone over the fallen form of a megacore as a new light of hope for the future of peace. Epilogue Naruto carried on his leadership role for the next ten years. He worked as Kanoha's Godame Hokage and the leader of the Allied forces. The Allied forces demobilized and turned into a police force that occupied the lesser nations. After three years, each of the occupied nations was freed and leaders were elected by the people. The people unanimously elected leaders that would support Naruto and help promote prosperity to the elemental nations. The role of Allied commander became a coordinator of international events and a holder of the peace. Ninjas from each nation held their positions as Allied shinobi as the highest honor they could seek and they received missions and updated orders from embassies that were located in every major city of the elemental nations. Naruto's family was granted a position of nobility and the daimyo of each nation elected him as mediator of all their meetings. Naruto didn't really appreciate this duty, but it was essential for him to synchronize his efforts and make sure that each nation's needs were addressed. The daimyo never figured out that they only ever talked to shadow clones, but hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Naruto used his position with the daimyos to deliver prosperity to every nation, which was greatly appreciated by the people of the elemental nations. As Godame Hokage, Naruto instituted many reforms that were heavily supported by the people. Every ten years the people were given the right to vote if they wished for the continued reign of the current Hokage. This inspired other nations to follow Kanoha's example, which made the people feel like they had a voice. Naruto also expanded the Hokage Tower in order to fit all of the new support staff that he hired. These support staff worked to support the council in an effort to help them govern. This reduced Naruto's Kanoha-related paperwork drastically, much to Hiruzen's lament. Naruto only dealt with one-tenth of the paperwork that Hiruzen had on a daily basis. After ten years of leading the elemental nations, Naruto stepped back from his international leadership role in order to spend more time with his family. Naruto was blessed by the women in his life and each of them played a key role in helping him bring prosperity to the country. Hinata blessed him with four children in ten years and last year she birthed twins. Samui was slower on the baby manufacturing, but she was pregnant with her third child. AI and B doted on the strawberry blonde children with many gifts of shinobi origin. Samui left them both with bumps on their heads when AI gave a 100-pound weight set to her five-year-old boy. 
Kuratsuchi took over the Tsuchikage role from her father last year and she decided to stop at two children due to her duties as Tsuchikage. A Naruto blood clone constantly helped her raise the children in IWA and she spent the weekends in Konoha with the rest of the family. Haku was a totally devoted wife, and she wanted a massive family, so she was on her fifth pregnancy and had triplets with Naruto two years ago. Enko finally caught the baby fever and cranked out a boy and a girl to join in the craziness. Both children had their mother's purple hair with Naruto's electric blue eyes. Tamari has blessed Naruto with three children, two of which popped out with the Uzumaki red hair. Gara and Kenkuro would pay Naruto in sake to flash them into Konoha over the weekends to spend time with their nieces and nephews. Ino was a creator of beautiful blonde babies that were full of spunk like their mother. The five toe-head blondes running around the Namikaze compound were testament to that. Cheyenne Namikaze birthed two children for Naruto and found that her time in the Namikaze compound was the biggest blessing in her life. The shrieks of children and the biggest family in Konoha filled her heart with joy. She was trying nightly with Naruto because she really wanted a baby boy, despite how much she loved her baby girls. Koyuki Kazahanu Uzumaki was given the painful blessing of giving birth to quadruplets. It was a hectic pregnancy that required constant attention from Tsunade and daily chakra infusions from Naruto. Tsunade made sure the pregnancy went through without any major setbacks, but Koyuki decided that four was enough for her. She stayed with Naruto in Konoha and Sandeu continued to rule in her stead. She would warp to Spring Country every Tuesday for their council meetings with Naruto, who was asked to be an honorary ruler of Spring Country. Finally, Shin regularly spent time in the Namikaze compound. Her presence became a regular this amongst the Uzumaki Namikaze family. She didn't officially marry Naruto because they were from two different realms, but the death goddess had centuries of pent-up sexual frustration that she made Naruto help her with. Turns out that Naruto's chakra application tricks even work on goddesses. She has gained the approval of Naruto's wives and they all look forward to spending the afterlife together with their family in her court. The first international reform that Naruto made was using ninjutsu for the betterment of the people. Earth users would create highways, till fields and help with the agricultural production around the elemental nations. Water users helped to reroute waterways and provide proper irrigation of the fields. They also helped to set up hydroponic power plants that provided electricity to nearby cities. Fire users were commonly used to burn fields, work in various forms of energy production and helped wherever needed. Lightning users developed chakra batteries that powered the new developing technology that was popping up everywhere. Turns out peace provides a great opportunity for development. Wind users, well wind users didn't do too much, much to Naruto's chagrin. One major thing that Naruto has done is declare that the biju will no longer be sealed into human vessels. The Biju gave their consent to spend the remainder of their host's life with their partners, but the death of Rashi last year marked the first freeing of the Biju. Son Goku took up residence on Yuzashiagakor and lived in the jungle there. Naruto worked regularly with him to create quality farmland through the use of his lava jutsu. Son Goku was paid in barrels of the finest sake or whiskey, which was the payment he requested. Travelers initially freaked out when they saw a massive red gorilla walking casually throughout the elemental nations, but each biju was allowed to choose a squad of allied shinobi that they would travel with. These shinobi were all A to S rank and were tasked with protecting the biju from any would-be attackers. Nagato revived Yuzushio and became responsible for maintaining the new home of the tailed beasts. When Isabu, the Sanbai Biju, reformed, Naruto negotiated with him, and he now inhabits the waters around Yuzushiagakor. He patrolled the oceans and was responsible for the death of the pirate trade. Isabu also worked over the years to bring life back to Suna's desert. He would use massive water jutsus to create oases that made travel through the desert a much more pleasurable journey. This in turn boosted Suna's economy and created a lifelong debt from Suna to the Uzumaki Namikaze family. 
Isabu wished for payment in gold, which he hoarded in his caves scattered throughout the oceans. Isabu was overjoyed when Kurama introduced Naruto as the child that the sage spoke of. Naruto appreciated Isabu's laid-back attitude and developed a seal that would prevent him from ever being sealed again. Isabu cried like a baby when Kurama held him down and Gyuki pierced his right tusk. That piercing held the anti-sealing tag that protected him. Another major change was the development of railroads that linked each nation to further enhance the bonds between countries. These railroads were developed using Spring Country as a model and after ten years there were veins of railroad linking every major nation. Allied shinobi of sea to be rank were responsible for coordinating with each nation to provide security to the trains. The people of the nations credited Naruto for inspiring this development and the rapid transportation helped to eliminate xenophobia over time. One hilarious event that happened over the past ten years was the all-out fight between Naruto and the AIB combo. The event was televised, and people set up all around the barrier that hosted the legendary battle. The battle was held in the foothills of Kumo, and a three-square-mile barrier was set up for the battle-crazed trio. Naruto clones dashed around the battlefield capturing footage for the televised event to the gratitude of the people. The battle lasted for five hours and each of the three looked like minced meat in their post-fight interviews. Naruto was credited with the win, and this established a semi-annual tradition where the previous victor would accept new challengers. These events inspired the new generation and made sure that the leaders of each nation stayed strong. Flashing forward to the end of Naruto's life, he lived to be ninety years old before he asked Shin to take him to the pure world. He could have lasted much longer but he wished to be reunited with his wives. He took regular trips to Shin's domain to visit his wives and some of his fallen children. His heart was no longer in the living realm, and he was confident that he had left the elemental nations in good hands. He announced his intentions to the elemental nations and demanded that there should be a massive party held on the day of his death rather than mourning. On October 10, 90 years after the Kyubi attack, Naruto flashed to Yuzushiagakor to a gathering of the Biju and the leaders of the Elemental Nations. Each leader signed a blood pact that Naruto created that promised the sustained freedom of the Biju. Each Biju had their own protection, but Naruto wasn't going to chance it. All nine Biju signed agreements stating that they would not attack unprovoked and that they should use diplomacy first to handle any future disagreements with humans. Every leader signed the pact in blood, each biju put some of their chakra in as well and every future successor would have to sign the pact as well. The Uzumaki Namike's family was responsible for managing this pact, which Naruto's great-grandchildren swore that they would uphold. On Naruto's 90th birthday, Naruto worked with Shin to completely free Kurama from his seal. Kurama rarely spent time in the seal, but he still appreciated the freedom that his partner gave him. Kurama cried as he said his goodbye to Naruto gave a final address to his family and the people of the elemental nations. To my family and the people of the elemental nations. It was 82 years ago that I promised Kurama that I would bring peace to the elemental nations. It fills my heart with joy to have lived in this peace for the last 70 plus years. To my descendants, you are the light of my life. I am so proud of each of you. For those that lost count, I was the last Uzumaki and Namikaze. My family now stands 400 strong. To my family, I ask that you remember that family comes before all. I recommend that to everyone listening as well. Continue to work together, continue to prosper together and reach new heights. I believe in my people. I believe in our future. This old man has a tendency to ramble on so before I talk your ear off let me tell you this. I love you all. It was the desire to protect the people I love that gave me so much strength. Live your life with love and know that I will continue to watch you from the pure world. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.